inspiration for this, I decided to go completely off my own memories, which are on, if not over two decades old at this point, just because I, I have such a clear impressions, I'm recording by the way, of, okay. of what this movie was to me. And so I, I'm also, I'm just going to kind of off to the side, I'm going to pull up the IMBD for it. Just it's interesting to see what resonates the most about it too, because the things that, that you do remember, even whether they're you know, completely accurate or not. Like those are the things that make these things, these properties important to us. Usually, you know, it's yeah. always interesting to see what, what we keep with us. Yeah. Cause I, I just remember I had a massive crush on the secondary character and I, I can't remember the primary human characters at all. It was the, the, the kind of geek with, you know, the, indis the, a completely indeterminate accent. And he, he was just so, yes. I, I had a little me had a massive crush on him and he, you know, he was the main character in the second one. Yes, Fisher so. Fisher Stevens uh, is the name of the actor, and um, um, he was not, you know, um, uh, Indian American. He was not Pakistani. It, that, looking back, it was, you know, such a, it was a performance that didn't seem like uh, brown face or anything like that. He was ethnic, but. And he was very good at performing it. And it's one of the performances that I think flew under the radar, uh, you know, <laughs> culturally. It would never be done again. Um, but he's, he's a lovely actor and, and a director. He became a, he became a director uh, and still is uh, all through the 90s. Um, okay. Fisher did a, a bunch of great independent films. And uh, we, I do refer to his character in the stuff I worked on because I so, loved him too. Yeah. So just kind of to get the story started, we've been talking for a while now, and you know how oh, when you're on these websites, there's little things that your brain just kind of filters out because there's stuff all over the computer screen. And yes. part of that was that little mini bio you have under your Twitter. And I, I was more interested in what we were talking about. And so I, was, I, I always look at the text, of your text and not the you know extraneous stuff. But I was glancing at that the other day and my, my eyes caught the word short circuit and I'm like that can't be so I looked up at it and it said you were the director on short circuit and I just started I was really busy so I didn't have time to think about it but it started this irritating itch in the back of my mind and it's like that's really cool that he was in, 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 in integral in such an important part of my childhood but I didn't think he was that old I thought we were the same generation and so you know my mind's kind of chewing on this in the background like wait a minute well if he's as old as my oldest sister and then I like Nah, the movie was older than that, so I went back and like you would have been nine when Short Circuit came out. <laughs> I, I think I don't know how old you are, but I'm like this hat, this can't be right. So I go and I Google it, and I discover there was a remake planned. And I'm like, how yes. did I miss this? How did? And so I went back. It was in 2009, which was the year after I graduated. I was literally in the bush, Alaska, for the majority of that year. So I was just completely cut off from everyone and everything, which is how I missed uh, kind of a cultural milestone like that. But then uh, I started just frantically looking for this remake and I couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> and I finally dug up something that said it was dead. But I'm then, looking like, now, I'm actually Googling it to go like, all right, what's the, I'm, I'm trying to connect the dots myself. So three days later, I swear there was something about it. There was a YouTuber I follow occasionally had something about a short circuit remake and I'm like but why would she be doing an 11 year old story and turns out that they're talking about making a new remake of it which i didn't yes. know but it's funny that this all has okay first off has that always been on your twitter bio or did i just miss it for the first part i think it has it probably got cobbled over from my imdb or something i it's i always confuse everybody uh, in a in a good way, although this is the thing that a lot of agents and people will tell you not to do because they want to pigeonhole you. But I've done many, many different jobs. And the reason people tell you not to is they kind of treat people as a brand. So if you're somebody who makes a puppet show like Greg the Bunny, then you stick to TV, you stick to puppets, don't do anything else. And then, you know, I through the connections I'd made, I was lucky enough to sell a feature at Sony. And suddenly I was working at Sony on the feature that I had written, I was taking feature assignments. So I was in this whole feature world, but still doing like puppet shows and for independent film channel and stuff on the side, 
Um, then I started doing robot chicken. So now I was in stop motion. I started doing more animated things like different forms. Shorts, you know, I went to. Uh, uh, NYU undergrad f in their arts school, so I was used to jumping into a lot of different things and different interests and I had friends in different medium and so. Uh, you know, if I had wanted to, I'd probably just jam with a band or something. You just gravitate toward things that are creative. But what it made was a really weird resume of like awkward stuff that didn't fit together. <laughs> and nobody in the feature world knew I did TV and nobody in TV really knew I did features. <laughs> like, okay, so yeah, I've got so many questions, but he here's a real concrete one. What is a feature? When you say feature, how is feature different from your bunny your bunny or your puppetry. one of the most frustrating things is how everyone will have their own definitions for what is a producer what is a feature what is a this and that but i'll give you mine which is the most generalized and i think the most public definition a feature really means it has to do with length um, a feature presentation is something that would probably be a minimum of 90, 80 to 90 minutes. I think legally it can't be called a feature unless it's a minimum of 85 minutes in length. So usually a traditional movie length was 90 minutes to two hours. Um, features also became known as those things that would appear only theatrically. Um, so these would be produced by a, a film studio, um, to appear in theaters across the country or across the world. And then eventually they would reach home video markets and things like that. Today, it's all the same. I mean, you know, The Mandalorian is a feature or a series of features, and yet we call it a TV show. Um, but before Game of Thrones, there really wasn't a, f a feature television series like that before. This is where cable and streamers have just changed the model completely, which is refreshing, actually. It's great to tear down these definitions. But when I speak about TV work, that was me producing short films at first for cable. I was lucky enough to um, eventually translate some of the stuff I'd been working on uh, in cable to a, a sitcom, a half hour sitcom for Fox. And, you know, when you go to these new arenas, you meet new people and you kind of become exposed to a new like um, niche of the industry. And it's I'm, I count myself very lucky that I've been able to work in so many little different areas, kind of like a jack of all trades and a master of none. <laughs> but I like that I've well, had you know, that's not the same. It's the jack same. of all trades, master of one is the original oh, master phrase. of one. I always liked the nun meaning like, oh yeah, so you're not really superb at anything because you spend all your time, which is how I approach life. I'd rather be uh, competent at many wonderful things, but they all do um, have things that overlap and apply. In fact, uh, you know, doing a show like Glitch Text for Nickelodeon Animation, I was able to learn a great deal that I didn't know, but I also brought a ton of procedure and ideas from live action and from feature um, that ended up, you know, really helping. So it's good to be well-rounded. But features was a very lonely experience because in features, unless you have a writing partner, which I did for a few years, um, this great writer, director named Matthew Huffman, um, but it's still very lonely. It's, you tend to, you work with a studio and getting an assignment, or maybe they give you notes on something you've written. You go off for a few months, you make those changes. You're not interacting with anyone else. You just go home to your computer. Whereas in television, it tends to be um, much more collaborative with a room full of people every day. Um, so I really enjoy television more. But for quite a few years, I was doing feature work, most of it for Sony Pictures, who had rights to Short Circuit at the time through their relationship with the Weinstein Company. Okay, so getting back on track, excellent yeah. segue. So this is what I remember about Short Circuit. And again, I'm just kind of, other than the date of the original release, I'm just kind of going off my own memories here. Uh, there were basically two movies that sort of cemented my love of robots and this sort of anthropomorphization of robots. It was Short Circuit, uh, that franchise, and then another one, something about batteries. And it was a bunch of cute little flying saucers that helped these oh, tenants yeah. of an apartment building. Uh, what was, 
Do you remember batteries, the name of that one? Yeah, that batteries was batteries not, not included. Which okay, was, so yeah, those were my two Spielberg sort of, produced films. Yeah, those are those those are sort of my two introductions into the friendly robot genre. Mm-hmm. And uh, looking back, I was two when the original Short Circuit came out. So naturally, my my first experience of the Short Circuit franchise was Short Circuit 2, which uh, mainly because it came out on VHS and my family was kind of, well, broke at the time. So we waited and checked these things out from the library. So I watched it. I loved it. Uh, okay, so a robot gets hit, a uh, military dr- drone type robot gets hit by lightning, achieves sentience. And gets adopted by, I think there was a, a female lead, a, ma- a male lead who's like a scientist. And then there yeah. was the secondary male character who was just the prototypical geek of the day. I knew yes. it was the guy, you looked at him, and you automatically knew that everybody would be taking their software hardware issues to this guy. He, he was the tech guy. The, he reminds me a lot of the characters on the IT crowd, the, the British show. Yes. So, and I just had the, the most massive crush on him. And I don't really remember that much of the movie. Of course, the big scene, Johnny Five Alive! <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, that was my impression. It was, look, look looking back, it was a, it must have been a fairly, I don't know if it was, I honestly can't tell if it was a really cheap or really expensive movie. I mean, I mean, yeah, we're talking 20-year-old memories here. But I think it was expensive at the time. Uh, mid, It was like the mid-80s, and um, movies like um, Gremlins and Ghostbusters were really, you know, doing well at the box office, and, and that, t- in Hollywood terms, meant they were interested in these kind of offbeat stories. Obviously, E.T. had come out, and they involved being high-budget enough that con- very convincing um uh, puppets had to be built. So there was not really any uh, CG assistance. There was only optical effects, which is, you know, um, uh, film effects done, you know, almost in an animation style with like matte paintings and things like that, that you can all Google and find out about. It's fascinating. And um, and puppetry. So that was what was common to all of those or some element of costumes and complex puppetry. And in many cases, uh, robotics were involved. So Short Circuit had the first completely, um, you know, um, robot puppet that was supposed to really um, be expressive. And it its design is so functional and yet appealing. I think that's half of the charm of the movie. Um, and I will also say for anyone who sees it, you know, it's going to be very dated to the 80s. It's going to be very corny by some standards with its emotion (laughs) but the reason i think it did work is that it was still in the in the 80s when um a lot of filmmakers from the 70s who took filmmaking very seriously were starting to get into more commercial um storytelling but they still had a, a foot in you know creating things that felt grounded things that felt real they still believe very strongly in directing actors and good performances. John Badham is the director of Short Circuit. And if you research some of his other um, movies, he has an amazing career. So this crazy idea done grounded enough and with enough believability by some very earnest actors, it creates a really earnest, sweet movie. Um, And I think that's why it holds up. In fact, you know, it's a very similar movie. It's kind of a precursor to the Iron Giant, which is also a beautiful and very earnest film with the same themes, you know, a robot who decides he doesn't want to be a gun, you know? No, no, no. It's, come on, I I have to not cry if we're going to get through this interview. (laughs) Yeah, but that's what Short Circuit is ultimately about. The the Short Circuit is that he has a soul and a conscience. Okay, so... Could you just t- share your experience with Short Circuit with me? So you're, you're a little older than I am. So you, you did, did you go see it in the theaters, the first one? Yes, I was in uh, 80s baby. I, I was a 1972 uh, baby, actually. And I was an 80s movies kid. So Ghostbusters and Gremlins and, and um, Goonies, like that was my generation. So we were seeing some really crazy fun stuff. And I just remember going to Short Circuit and being fascinated especially for someone like me who was a big fan of puppetry and the muppets that's why i eventually did greg the bunny um which was a puppet based show so i was really in love with um the craftsmanship and the performance of puppets 
and I knew that Johnny Five, the robot, was not um, obviously real, but I thought that the performance was incredible, like very convincing and very well done, and and I admired that so much. Okay, so so I loved um, it. one thing about the again I, I'm going off old memories here, but I I seem to recall. The Johnny Five robot, that design, was actually quite a bit like, uh, which rover was it? Was it Curiosity? Well, that The big rover we sent to Mars, it had the same eye, kind of like the eye shape. And yes. I was wondering, was that because that's just basically the only practical design for a robot that's going to be going into situations where it can't be taken care of immediately? And how, how did this cheesy 80s movie ping on a design that would end up being so close to a robot that wasn't deployed to Mars till, till the 90s. I think it goes back to um, the comment about that 70s filmmaking. There's like, verisimilitude was very important. It wasn't about style first. It was about something that you would believe came out of a wartime robotics company. And these are the same um, companies too that were building Mars rovers and moon la landers and things like that. So it began with what would be real? You know, what it's not an alien from another planet. It's supposed to be something, you know, made by human hands that was, you know, common for the time in the 80s. So that meant um, getting around on treads, which a lot of things on lunar surfaces would need. Um, swivel heads with kind of lens eyes and things like that. So by being faithful, they had this to work with. And then there was also the practicality of production. We, you know, we can't do robot legs like we can today, actually. You know, MIT has these amazing talking, uh, walking robots. Um, but back then, you also needed treads to just get around on the set. You know, it was if you wanted your robot to walk, it had to be a man in a suit like C-3PO. Um, but they opted to do a completely non-human body. And I know that the other reason they chose to do that was so that you really would believe in it that much more. Because if it did look like a person in a suit, you know, you might be too distracted. You might be able to imagine it as a costume. But when you see Johnny Five, one of the reasons it's so memorable is that you know there is no way there's a person in there. And in an age before CGI, kids like me were just mind blown as to how something like that could be on screen and interact with actors and seem so real. Yeah, there was something similar I saw. Uh, you mentioned The Mandalorian in a, in a recent episode. Uh, the one where he's on the, on the planet where it's being strip mined and the, the attack robots they send after him. Yes. There was this one scene where they jump up onto the roof and my I swear one of my first thoughts was, I wish I could talk to you about this because <laughs> there was something, I don't know if that was CGI or puppetry, but there was something specifically in the way the robot's joints moved. It did not move like, not just not, just not like a human, but not like a, an organic being. This yes. was a very, very robotic movement. The robot reached up with its arms, grabbed the edge of the roof, and then it did some sort of flip maneuver that rotated its entire body around the joints and its shoulders. And that, it stuck out so much to me that it almost pulled me out of the story. I'm like, that is so cool, because I've seen robots like that in one of those videos released from MIT, and it was that exact movement. Yeah. And someone clearly did their research there, and they're clearly going for that making it real and trying to make it real for the long term. And my final thought before the next scene was that that effect right there, that's going to hold up. Yes. And other scenes in The Mandalorian won't. Like the... You're right. The, the, the robot who is clearly the guy in the suit with the ants looking head. I mean, like 100... They didn't even bother trying to pretend it wasn't a guy in a suit. Now that looks old and cheesy now, but this scene, I really think it's going to hold up because I'm like, they must have gotten someone in or seen that bit same YouTube video that I'd seen and they're like that is so clearly not a guy in a suit that it made yes. a really great effect and I was kind of wondering was that CGI or a practical effect because it's I getting really hard to tell these days. Normally I'd say I would normally say it's CGI but I believe that it's a little bit of both only because I know that um 
the producers of The Mandalorian, you know, believe very strongly in keeping a foot in those things that did make Star Wars a unique universe. And part of that was the need to build things practically and have them on set. Um, a good example is the IG-11 character who is the bounty hunter robot on that show who swivels and moves in, in incredibly unique ways. He will turn his torso without turning the head, things like that, that are completely inhuman. And I know that they did have a puppet rig for a good amount of it. Disney Plus has a good documentary on the making of that series. But it's interesting to note that they were also using a robot that was designed back in 1980 six for the empire strikes back as the model so the limitation of the previous generation kind of became part of the character that they had to bring to life now here in the you know new millennium and it's interesting that you know it, it affected a unique character trait they i might be misquoting this phrase but like that idea that the enemy of art is the absence of limitation is absolutely true there's nothing wrong with cgi when people would say they hate cgi they prefer puppets like to me that's like hating an electric keyboard uh you know it's these are just tools it's what you do with them that matters the only thing about cgi that to me is potentially tragic is that when you can do anything and you have no limitations things get to ten get to be generic um when the movie i robot came out with will smith i think they were just uh. starting to use motion capture so there was a lot of what was unique about that was like oh these robots are running and acting so fluidly like people but then they and that's impressive i guess but it ceases to be robotic whereas now they're able to combine that with the limitations of movement that make something seem alien or limited or inhuman and we're drawn to that stuff it's fascinating um mm -hmm. and then you know all these projects are made by detail nerds like us and they do do their <laughs> research i mean it's their chance to call mit and meet with those people and you know I, it's so wonderful to go have the opportunity to go seek out all these amazing people and learn this stuff and I think you always have to reconcile what what is real with what will work for the illusion you're making <laughs> in entertainment, you know, and trying to make that blend because with short yeah, circuit, I... it still had to be appealing. It had to be an emotive character. And I'm sure the eyes were much bigger than they would normally be. And the head looks very much like E.T., which was a huge hit in the early 80s. And so things influence each other. So, uh, were you a big fan as the short circuit of the short short circuit two when it came out? Or I was mostly a fan of the first one. That's the one I saw in the theater. Um, when the second one came out, I enjoyed it. But that I saw that one. I remember on home video, and it was fun. But I, sequ I sequels really had to earn my appreciation. I'm the world's biggest Ghostbusters fan, and. I, you know, but I don't really watch Ghostbusters. <laughs> uh, I love when things are really fresh and new and done for the first time, which is not to say I don't like any of those sequels. It's just that when I have my choice, I almost always put on the originals. Um, okay, so what I liked here, about here's the a good segue question. Michael McKay and I loved. <laughs> how did you get involved in the this potential remake that died? But how did you get involved in that? Well, I had been... Um, a uh, producer named Laura Ziskin, who made the Spider-Man films, had seen Greg the Bunny when it was on the Independent Film Channel. And she was one of a few people that had just expressed an interest in meeting myself and my creative partners and learning who we were. And so, you know, we met and it was at a time we were looking to create Greg the Bunny as a larger TV show. And she had no interest in that. She just thought there was something very charming about it. And she just wanted to get to know us. And in the time that she did that, um, I was meeting other companies, including a lot of them were puppetry related. One of them was um, the Henson Company and another was Stan Winston Studios. And Stan Winston was an amazing man who'd done the Terminator robots and everything. and. Um, he inspired me to come up with a script idea about a boy and a monster uh, that my friend Matthew Huffman and I wrote together, and we sold it to Sony 
with Laura Ziskin's help. Laura Ziskin and Stan Winston were going to produce this together, and for many years we worked on it. And during that time, I met other producers, and I got to know people at the studio, um, and they came to know me and my partner too as somebody who liked to write, um, you know, kind of Spielbergian, kind of heartwarming, um, uh, unusual movies like very oddball stuff like Ghostbusters and all that, like just sort of bizarre family uh, comedies that were a bit sweet. And so I think Sony at the time had the rights to short circuit, but they had been licensed. It gets so complicated with these things because a, a property can be owned by many producers, some of them in the US, some of them overseas, some are aligned with a studio, some are not. So you always have to reconcile like who has the the current right to make something. And I believe the property was licensed by the Weinstein Company, who's doing New Line Cinema at the time. Uh, and they were looking for pitches. So somebody at Sony put me on a list saying, oh, you know, it seems like Milano would be into this. They, everyone knew I was obsessed with Ghostbusters, like security guards literally had to pull me out of the like Ghostbusters car on the Sony lot. Like that's a true story. I was almost ejected from the studio. Uh, and I didn't care. I was very bold about it. I remember the Laura Ziskin saying like, Are you crazy? I am just extremely not surprised. Yeah. I mean, we, when you have the opportunity to get in that car, you do it. And she's like, are you nuts? You're going to get kicked off the lot. And I said, Hey, Laura, I, you can't put me in a parking lot with that car. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> it was worth it. So long story short, this just becomes what happens. You, you, you sort of get on a list of people, or maybe if you have an agent, they find out about an opportunity and they say, well, do, are you a fan of short circuit? And I said, yes. And oh, well, they're thinking about doing a new one. And would you be interested in taking a meeting about it? So I said, absolutely, because I did really love that film um, very much. And I thought it would be kind of fun to update. And I had a lot of questions about it and what it could be. Um, so I took a meeting with uh, somebody who told me they were looking for like kind of a family film, um, less about the adult characters than before, maybe something involving, um, you know, a Johnny Five robot meeting a kid. And I was full of questions like, can it be the same robot? Does it have to be a different robot? And they don't like to answer that. They just say, look, you come in and just pitch whatever you want. So I had a pitch I developed where I told what I saw as the story beginning to end, just about in a like 20 minute pitch of, um, it was not a remake, but it was not a sequel because they didn't want a sequel. I knew that much. They wanted like a, a, a new story. They probably would have been willing to do a full remake or reboot, but what I pitched was uh, a story about a scientist who, this is gonna sound, so uh, trite, but that's probably why they bought it. It was like... <laughs> Name me one one great movie ever that does not sound trite in the pitch. Yeah, it really does. Say. It's always like, when I'm about to say this, and this is like 15, 20 years ago, and I think, man, this is like what everyone was pitching at the time, but it's like, kid, single parent, the other parent recently passed away. There's a bit of a divide. They don't know quite how to grieve. You know, it's not something they're discussing. Father's buried in work. Um, son is um, uh, acting out at school a bit. Um, they need a change. Uh, you know, his birthday comes and on his birthday, uh, his father can't quite get home to him in time. And he you find out he's kept this box of keepsakes to remember his mother, including this like box of uh, candies. I, I really wanted there to be a reason why the short circuit took place, kind of like a spiritual reason. So this is very schmaltzy, but I decided that he would have these little candy hearts and he didn't eat them. Um, he kept them in his pocket because they were from his mom. And he ends up having to go to his dad with his dad to work where they're testing these robots and there's an assembly line and one thing leads to another and the, he get, loses the candy heart and it goes rolling and we sort of follow it as it ping, ping, ping goes like 
through the ducts of the place and onto the conveyor belt where it eventually drops into and melts on the motherboard that short circuits. And it's not that the robot turns into the kid's mom or anything, but when it, when it short circuits and comes to life, um, there's this spirit in it that you're meant to feel like, oh, maybe, maybe the mom sort of sent this uh, family member to them, like to, to bring them together and, you know, for father and son to bond and all that kind of thing. And it just became a story where the, the robot um, malfunctions, gets loose, meets up with the kid who hides it in his backyard. Dad and, and everyone is searching for this missing military robot. Meanwhile, the kids got it like in the house under dad's nose um, and they're bonding. And what, what I loved about the original short circuit was how Johnny Five would learn from anything he read or anything he saw on television. So we were able to do that, except I did it, you know, with the inter internet generation. So he's just Googling everything and he's full of, you know, memes and he's full of, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> internet logic. But what was important to me was that I, I try to have characters from the original film, uh, or at least the actors, I tried to write them roles. Like I wanted Ali Sheedy to be the principal at the kids' school. I wanted Steve Gutenberg to be um, a key scientist in the story. Fisher Stevens was meant to be the janitor at the school who um, really is instrumental in helping Johnny Five um, escape. And it's, it's pretty beautiful. It, it, there's some really cool parts to it where, you know, Johnny Five kind of takes the kid on a, a rocket flight. He helps him out at school. Um, and I tried to make it, as corny as it all sounds, as, as realistic as possible with kids that would act the way I feel like real kids would act. Like, just like Glitch Techs, it, you know, there's such crazy stuff going on, but you try to write people that seem like real people because if you can relate to them and they believe in the characters, then you know, it should work. So long story short, I had to pitch this to Bob Weinstein, not Harvey, but over the phone, I pitched it to Bob Weinstein and he shockingly, I'd heard such terrible things about these guys, but shockingly, it was a great call because I was very visual in my pitch. I talked about how five and the boy would go like walking down the street and it was a blackout but one by one, all the like street lamps would turn on as Johnny passed under them and things like that just made him really excited. He had also read the script I had sold, which was very much a, a, um, a kid and a creature relationship. So he's like, that's a great pitch. You've got the job, you know, we'll, we'll work out the details. Uh, when can you start? And then I had to begin working. Um, the original idea is also owned by David Foster, who produced the original film. And things got awkward and political only in that the Weinsteins wanted to make something totally new, and they very much wanted to cut David Foster out of the process. <laughs> but David Foster was like my primary contact and the person I had to speak with every day. Um, and I just chose... Because ah, so, so you mean political in the traditional Greek sense of the word, meaning you had to deal with people. So <laughs> had to deal with people, and there were there was subtext, and there were like uh, alliances, and you know, I was not I was supposed to turn a deaf ear to David, but I didn't do that. I love David. I he was an at this time a veteran producer um, with so much to say. He's so in love with the original film, and to the Weinstein's, I think it was just a property to exploit. And I felt I could please both of them. You know, I, I, I always was deeply involved in things David had to say. And thankfully, David was also very trusting to me. So if I wanted to push back about something, he, he would trust me. And I never had an issue. But that was my first experience in those kind of studio politics where this person doesn't want me to talk to that person and that kind of nonsense. Um, but it worked out just fine. And I did several drafts of the script. Um, and uh, I wasn't the director. I was the primary writer. <laughs> Other directors came on. There was talk of um, a few of them, but two were assigned in the time I was there. And I'm not remembering uh, their names for some reason. But I got to go to the Sony Archives building. And actually, uh, they opened up a crate. And I got to like touch Johnny Bob. <laughs>